The Spirit of the Well There was once a couple who lived in a small village and who used to argue all the time. One day, the wife became so enraged with something said by her foul-mouthed husband that she clipped him around the ear and he tumbled into their deep well. Now at the bottom of that well, as is often the case, lived a genie, and he was an unusually fierce and abominable one. As soon as the husband saw him, he started to scream and shout, to pull him about and to shower upon him such abuse as he had not heard since the days of the great King Suleiman, son of David, upon whom peace, until the genie, affronted and affrighted, was forced to rise from his dwelling. This was how he came to ascend into the sky, towering over the terrified wife as she stood looking down into the depths of the well. Miserable woman, roared the genie as soon as he saw her. Who is responsible for flinging that unbelievably appalling human into my well, disturbing my peace and causing me to flee from my home of the past ten thousand years? What about me? asked the woman. I have had to live with that man for two decades, and you cannot stand him for two minutes. You unfortunate creature, cried the genie, for he was not without some better feelings, and the howls of the frightful husband were still ringing in his ears. I certainly do see your point of view. Well, said the woman, since I do not want him out of the well, and you do not want to go back, you might as well come along with me to the city, for I have decided to walk there to see what life might have in store for me. To stay here would be to starve, and in any case I want to get as far away from that man as possible. The genie agreed, and they set off along the road, chatting amicably together. Presently the genie said, how are you going to live in the big city? Something will turn up, said the woman. My suggestion, said the genie, is this. The king has a daughter. I will enter into her brain and possess her. Then you come along and cast me out, and the king will reward you. That is an excellent idea, said the woman. But there is one proviso, said the genie. That is, that you will only use the word of exorcism once, otherwise I will always be at your mercy. All right, said the woman. The genie sped on ahead and drove the princess completely mad. She writhed and she cried, she cursed and she threw herself about, and everyone soon realized that a genie of some kind had entered into her. As soon as the woman reached the town, she met people who told her the terrible story. The king, they added, has promised illimitable gold to anyone who can cure her and to hang anyone who falsely pretends to be able to do so. As soon as she reached the main market of the city, the woman began calling out, Genies cast out! The world's greatest caster out has arrived! Bring out your begenied people! I shall cast them out! Almost at once she was seized by the royal guards and taken to the king. The princess was brought forward, grimacing and howling, and the woman, using the word which the genie had told her, cast her out. Of course the king, as well as the princess, was delighted by this, and they rewarded the exorcist with as much gold as she wanted, and she established herself in a palace of her own, which rivaled that of the monarch himself. But the genie was not finished. After a few months roaming about, unable to go home to his well and feeling the need to do some further mischief, he found himself back in the selfsame city, and, almost without noticing what he was doing, entered into the princess's mother, the queen. The king immediately called the exorcist woman and commanded, Cast out this demon at once, or I shall kill you. Since it was a matter of her life or the genie, she went to the queen's bedside and whispered the magic word. With a roar and a rush, the infuriated spirit stood beside her in the form of an ox with a snake's head, breathing out fumes and rolling his eyes. 
By the great King Suleiman, son of David, on whom peace, he roared, I shall seize you for this, and you will never be able to cast me out, for you will be too begenied to remember the magic word. My dear friend, said the clever woman, if you dare to do that, I shall immediately return to my husband, and you and I will have to enjoy him for the rest of your time inhabiting me. And, at the frightful prospect, the genie took flight, roared away, and has never been seen again. The Princess of the Water of Life Once upon a time, when there was not a time, in the country of no place at all, there lived, all alone in a small hut, a poor girl whose name was Jada. Walking in the woods one day, Jada saw that a colony of bees had abandoned their honey, and she decided to collect it. I shall take it to market and sell it, and try to improve my life with the money I shall get, she told herself. Jada ran home and brought a jar, which she filled with the honey. But she did not know that the reason for her poverty was a malefic djinn, who tried all he could to prevent her from making anything a success. The djinn woke up as something told him that Jada was starting to do something useful, and he rushed to the spot, intent on causing trouble. As soon as he saw Jada with the honey, he turned himself into a branch attached to a tree, and jogged her arm so that the jar fell and broke, and the honey all seeped into the ground. The djinn, still in the form of the branch, laughed and laughed, swinging back and forth with glee. This will infuriate her, he cackled to himself. But Jada just looked at the honey and said to herself, Never mind, the ants will eat the honey and perhaps something may come of it. She had seen a line of ants whose scouts were already tasting the honey to see if it was useful to them. As she started to walk through the woods back to her hut, Jada noticed that a man on horseback was coming towards her. When he was only a few yards away, he idly raised his whip and struck at a tree in passing. Jada saw that it was a mulberry tree, and the blow had made the ripe fruit shower onto the ground. She thought, That's a good idea. I'll collect mulberries and take them to market to sell. Perhaps something will come of it. The djinn saw her collecting the fruit and laughed to himself. When Jada had filled her basket, he turned himself into a donkey and followed quietly behind her on her way to market. When she sat down to rest, the djinn in the form of a donkey edged up to her, nuzzling her arm. Jada stroked his nose, and then the horrid creature suddenly rolled over onto the basket of mulberries, crushing them to pulp. The juice ran all over the road, and the jinn ass gleefully galloped away into the bushes. Jada looked at the fruit in dismay. At that moment, however, the queen had been approaching on her way to the capital. Stop at once, she ordered her palanquin bearers, for that poor girl has lost everything. Her donkey has squashed her fruit and run off. She will be ruined if we do not help her. So the queen took Jada with her in her palanquin, and they became fast friends. She gave Jada a house, and Jada soon became a successful merchant in her own right. When he saw how well Jada was getting on, the djinn had a good look at her house to see what he could do to ruin her. He realized that she kept all her goods in a warehouse behind the house, so he set fire to the house and goods and the place was burnt to the ground in almost less time than it takes to tell. Jada had run out of the house when she smelt the smoke, and looked at the ruins with sorrow. Then she noticed that a line of tiny ants was forming, and then that they were carrying their stocks of corn, one grain at a time, from beneath the house to a place of greater safety. To help them, Jada lifted a large stone covering their nest. Beneath it gushed a spring of water. 
As Jada tasted it, the people of the city gathered around her and cried, The water of life! This is what has been foretold! They told her that it had been prophesied that one day, after a fire and after many disasters, a spring would be found by a young girl who disregarded calamities. This would be the last fountain of life. And that is how Jada became known as the princess of the water of life, which she still tends, and which can be drunk, to give immortality to those who find it by disregarding calamity. Fahima and the Prince There was once, in the city of Basra, a very beautiful and intelligent girl, expert at solving conundrums, and usually able to predict people's actions far better than they themselves ever could. Her name, in fact, was Fahima, the Understander. She had inherited a large fortune, and all the young men of the city, as well as a number of older ones, wanted to marry her, most of them hoping to get hold of her money. Women, too, sought her friendship. Those who did not want her wealth were curious about the source and action of her remarkable cleverness, and so Fahima was always besieged by suitors, well-wishers, idlers, and people trying to sell her things. Fahima shut herself away and very sensibly made it difficult for people to get to know her. Then, one day, when she was standing for a moment on the turret of her castle, briefly lit by the rays of the sun, a certain prince came by and saw her. He decided that he would marry her. The prince camped outside the castle and laid siege to the fair lady. He sang her songs, played on the lute, displayed his manly figure in a great variety of splendid robes, and sent her poems and messages. In between all these activities, he broke off to go hunting, withdrew to practice sword fighting, rode into the city to inspect the latest cargoes from distant lands, and generally acted as princes of that time usually did. Fahima, as we know, was wise, and she both liked what she had seen and heard of the prince, and understood him better than he understood himself. One day, therefore, when she went out of the castle and found herself seized and borne back to the prince's own castle, she was not as surprised as some people might have been. When he threw her into a dungeon without any discussion, she realized that he had done this because he had convinced himself that she would not marry him until he had shown his assertiveness and power, because, as you will have gathered, he was in the habit of coming to conclusions about situations without sufficient reflection. After some days, the prince went to Fahima's prison and called through the bars, Fahima, I want to marry you. I have money, I am young and strong and handsome, and I have you in my power, and I can do anything I like with you. Moreover, I can please you and make you an interesting and devoted husband. Fahima answered, Not by money? Not by honey, not by guile, nor by wile, not through boasting or even roasting. Day after day the prince went to the dungeon, and a similar kind of conversation took place. He suggested all the reasons why he thought she should marry him, and she rejected them all. Finally other things began to occupy his mind. After some months he decided to go to Baghdad for a time, and word of this came to Fahima through the gossip of her jailer. But Fahima had not been idle. All that time she had been tunnelling, and she now had a means of escape to the outside world. As soon as the prince left, Fahima went down her secret passage to freedom, and, hiring the fastest horses in Basra, made her way to the capital, arriving long before the indolent prince who made his way there in state, and with many halts to have food prepared, and for all kinds of other reasons. When the prince arrived in Baghdad he visited friends, he went hunting with hawks and gave lavish entertainment, and generally comported himself as princes did in those days. One day, 
strolling past a luxurious mansion, he saw a beautiful girl standing by a window. He thought, that lovely creature is almost exactly like Fahima of Basra. And well he might, for it was the very same girl who had established herself in Baghdad for the very purpose of meeting the prince. The prince immediately contrived to meet the lady and asked her to marry him. She agreed, they were wed, Fahima became a princess, and she gave birth in due course to a baby girl. The prince was delighted, of course. After a time, however, he decided to go on his travels again, and he journeyed to Tripoli. Fahima, leaving her child with a trusted servant, went there too and took a sumptuous house. Again the prince saw her, again he found that he wanted to marry her, thinking that she was another woman, and again they were married. This time they had a baby boy, and the prince was, of course, delighted. When wanderlust again arose in the prince's breast, he took ship to Alexandria, where, needless to say, Fahima also went, and everything went as before. The prince saw her, asked her to marry him, married her, and they had another child. After a year or two, the prince felt homesick for Basra, and he embarked for that city, leaving his wife, as he thought, in Alexandria. Fahima chartered a faster ship, and arrived back in time to be sitting in her dungeon when the prince went to see her. When he saw her, the prince began, for the first time, to feel remorse and distress. Ah, Fahima, he cried, I would still like to marry you, and I have treated you badly, leaving you imprisoned here for so many years. But I am not really the same man. I am even worse. I have done things which I should not have done, and I am unworthy of you, and, indeed, of the others about whom you know nothing. Fahima said, Are you prepared to tell me the truth about what has happened while you have been away? I might as well, said the prince, but it will make little difference. Clever as you are, even you would not be able to think of a solution to my problems, brought about by foolishness and lack of reflection. Fahima said, If you tell me the whole story, omitting no single detail, I might be able to suggest something. The prince then related how he had met and married beautiful girls in Baghdad, Tripoli and Alexandria, how he had three children, and how he wished he had acted differently. Were it not for me, said Fahima, you would have done all these things in an irrevocable form. If that had happened, you would not have been able to undo your folly, and others would have been harmed through your own selfishness. As it happens, I am able to unravel the thread for you. What is done cannot be undone, cried the prince, and as for the rest of your speech, I do not understand it at all. Go to your drawing room, said Fahima, and wait there until someone is announced, someone whom you must instantly have admitted to your presence. The prince did as she asked, and in an hour or so, dressed in all her finery and leading their three children, Fahima appeared at the castle gate. It was some time before the prince could understand that the four women were in fact one, and that all three of his children had the same mother. But when he realized what Fahima had done, in spite of what he had done to her, he was overwhelmed with joy and became a completely reformed character. They all lived happily ever afterwards. Salik and Kamala There was once a youth named Salik who lived in a city ruled by a stern king, whose edicts were so strict and so all-encompassing that people obeyed them without thinking and regarded them almost as laws of nature. The king had a daughter whose name was Kamala, which means perfection, and she was indeed perfection in every sense. She was intelligent, beautiful and wise, and there was a law that she was not to be seen or spoken to or even thought about too much. 
Of course, there were people who saw her sometimes, and some people had to speak to her from among her servants. But in general, people thought about her so little, and about the dangers of thinking about her so much, that many of the citizens almost feared her name. One day, however, Salik was walking by the seashore when he glimpsed the princess coming out of the sea after her morning bathe, and he fell in love with her. Or he thought that he had, for the many sensations of attraction, fear, and curiosity struggled within him. Salik spoke to his parents of what he had seen, and they were terrified, and advised him to forget the matter. We can have a good enough life here if we obey the king's orders and serve him within his commands, said his father, who was a respected and learned man. But Salik began to feel, more and more strongly, that he would like to see the princess again, and he took to haunting the seashore and wandering in the woods near the city, in the hope of glimpsing her. Now the princess, for her part, had also espied Salik and she fell in love with him. She confided in an old woman who visited the palace as a peddler, and the crone sought out Salik as she went from door to door. One day, after visiting hundreds of houses, the hag found herself face to face with Salik. My child, she said, the princess loves you, and you must now do your own part. In spite of what the king says, you must win your way through to the girl, and is she not more beautiful than the moon? Salik, of course, was astonished and delighted that such as he, an insignificant youth, should love and be loved by the princess, and he promised the old woman that he would find a way to meet her, and by seeking her out in spite of dangers, would prove his love. Encouraged by the exciting message, Salik felt fear of the king's wrath far less than before, and he quitted his house to walk through the city while he made plans to meet his beloved. He had not gone far when he came across a crowd, surrounding a man on a whipping block. What is happening? asked Salik. This man, the people told him, spoke in terms of admiration about the princess. Naturally, the king is having him punished. As he looked at the horror of the flayed flesh, Salik's heart sank, and he feared that such a fate might be his if he persisted in his secret desires. But as he continued on his way, his admiration and determination returned, and he started to lay plans to meet the girl. Then he turned a corner, and he found a crowd of people jeering at a man who was being evicted from his shop. They threw mud at him, and as the soldiers of the king flung all his goods on the street, the people stole them. When he asked what was happening, the people told Salik, Thus disgraced are those who covet the daughter of our most wise and powerful master, the king. This man made up a poem about her. Salik's heart turned to water, and he saw what the penalty might be for him. But then his resolve returned and he continued on his way. Presently he saw a man looking towards the sky as he walked, and suddenly the king's guards appeared, seized him, and carried him off. When Salik asked bystanders what crime the man had committed, they said, Looking upwards is a crime. Such a person might one day find himself gazing towards the princess's turret window, so he has to be stopped. So Salik to protect himself, started to walk with his gaze fixed on the ground. He had been walking along in this way for some time when he saw the old crone beckoning to him. Young man, she said, you are not doing anything about the princess, and if you love her as she loves you, you must take some steps towards it in case she becomes disenchanted with you. I think that I have made a start, said Salik. And how is that? asked the woman. First, I have said nothing about her to anyone except my parents. Second, I have composed no poetry about her. Then, said the old woman, why are you looking at the ground? I was just going to tell you, hag, said Salik, that I was protecting myself by not looking up at windows. 
You foolish creature, cried the woman. Do you not know that there is a law and custom that people do not look at the ground, in case this means that they are seeking the princess's footsteps? And she went on her way. Suddenly, as he was passing a house, thinking only of the princess, Salik heard a weeping and wailing from within. He rushed inside, calling out in his obsession, Is she dead? Oh, is she dead? Let me see her for the last time. The mourners looked at him and thought that he must be a madman. Young man, they said, we grieve because one of our relatives has died. But you, a stranger, have no right to burst in here in this unseemly manner. Besides, it is not a woman who has died, it is a man. Salik went on his way. Presently he found himself at a crossroads where a venerable sage sat, a Sufi teacher, with half-closed eyes. This man said to him, Salik, my friend, you have little time left to find the princess. You have been looking up and looking down. You have been following your own inclinations and exciting yourself over a death. Now it is time for you to find out whether you really seek the princess or whether you seek to avoid the manners of the people of this town. Salik cried out, But what can I do? What you can do is to take the straight road, said the Sufi. But because of what people are doing and having done to them, you cannot make this choice. Come with me. He took Salik by the arm, and together they walked along the road until they arrived at the palace of the king. Are you afraid of death? asked the old man. Are you afraid of loss of goods and disgrace? he continued. Are you afraid of advice and help? I only do what others do, and avoid what others avoid. Only, said the sage, what some others do, and some others do not do and this, you think, is the behaviour of all others. They entered the palace, and the Sufi guided Salik to the throne room where the king sat in court. Your Majesty, said the sage, this is the youth Salik, who has feared and who has imagined, and now he has come to you to ask for the hand of your daughter, the Princess Kamala, in marriage. I rule, said the king, over this area where danger is everywhere, where all must die, where people are constantly disapproved. Those who fear danger unnecessarily, who fear death, who cannot endure disapproval, remain slaves. Are they worthy of the daughters of those who rule? If your majesty's laws say that I must now die, then kill me, said Salik. If you disapprove of my ambition, disgrace me. All I now know is that I want to marry the princess. And that is how Salik married Kamala and became, in his turn, ruler of the kingdom. And Salik, of course, means seeker, while Kamala is the word for perfection. So he attained her only after he had put aside those things which stood between them. When the Devil Went to Amman Once upon a time there was an old woman going from the country to the city of Amman to visit her grandson. It was summer, and on the hot and dusty road she came upon a tired-looking but rather sinister man in a black cloak. Good morning, she said, for she had nothing better to do, and country people always salute one another. And a bad morning to you, he answered. That's a fine way to speak to people, said the old woman. And what kind of a man are you that you say such things to the children of Adam? I hate the children of Adam, and I talk like that because I am the devil, he snarled. The old woman was not at all afraid. And why should you be on the road to the great city, she asked. Ah, said the devil. There is plenty for me to do in such a place. You don't look like much of a devil to me, said the old woman. 
Why, I believe I could match anything that you could do any day. Very well, snapped the devil. I'll give you three days in Amman, and if you can do worse things than me, I'll leave the town alone for the rest of my days. So the bargain was struck, and the two of them arrived together in the city. When are you going to start? the devil asked, for he was longing to see some wickedness. I'll start right away, and you can watch me, providing, that is, that you can make yourself invisible, she told him. Like this? he asked, and she realized that he had made himself disappear from sight, though she could feel his hot breath on her ear. Now get on with it, he rasped. The old woman made her way to the shop of one of the biggest merchants of fine cloth in the city, and sat down at the entrance, asking the merchant to bring out some really fine silk. It would have to be something really unusual, she said. My grandson is in love with a certain married woman, and he wants to give her a present that she will never forget, to soften her heart towards him. She has said that she will yield, if only she can have a bolt of the very finest silk that can be found. Why you want it is no business of mine, so please do not tell me any details, replied the man. But I have here, as it happens, a bolt of the very finest cloth in all the world. Until the other day there were two bolts of it. Then I sold one to the royal palace, so you can imagine the quality. While she was examining it, the crone said, Now this is very expensive stuff, and I expect that I shall buy it. How is it that you are not treating me with the respect which is due to a valued customer? What do you mean? asked the merchant. Well, at the very least, you should call for a pipe for me, so that I have a smoke while I am deciding. The merchant immediately called for a pipe, which was brought, with charcoal burning well in the container on top of it. He also placed near her a plate of sticky pastry baklavas. Mumbling to herself, the old woman fingered the cloth and ate the pastry, and in between she puffed at the tube of the pipe. Suddenly the merchant noticed with dismay that she had smeared some of the honey from her fingers on the priceless cloth, and, even worse, she had tilted the pipe and allowed a piece of glowing charcoal to fall on the silk, burning a hole right through it. Ay, you foolish crone, he cried, you are ruining the cloth. Not at all. All I have to do is to cut it in a certain way and thus eliminate the stain and the hole, she said, because I am buying it anyway. How much did you say it was? A hundred pounds, he said expecting to conclude the bargain at fifty. But she immediately accepted without a quibble, paid him the money, and left the shop. As she went down the street, the devil whispered at her elbow, I don't call that much of a trick. True, you gave him a small shock, but you overpaid him and he thinks that you are a fool. He is more of a devil than you are. Be silent, hissed the old woman, and have some patience for goodness sake. Watch what I do next. So saying, she began to ask questions of people in a cafe, until she had found out the address of the home of the cloth merchant. It was a large and opulent-looking house, and the crone stood outside intoning prayers, and then knocked on the door. The merchant's wife called out, Who is there and what do you want? Peace be upon you, magnanimous lady, the old crone called up to her window. Know that I am only a poor woman from the country, come to visit my son. I am caught here in the street at the time of my special prayers, and I cannot find a quiet, clean place in which to say them. So the merchant's wife invited the pious lady in, and showed her into the large sitting-room on the ground floor. Kind lady, wheezed the aged one, as one last favour, I beg that I might be lent a prayer rug on which to kneel. The merchant's wife looked around and brought out her husband's sajada from his room and handed it to her. The old woman pretended to say her prayers, while the other woman withdrew to her own quarters. 
Then she rolled up the carpet, with the cloth which she had bought inside it, and handed the rug back with a thousand words and gestures of thanks and of humility. When she left the house, the devil again angrily asked her what kind of play-acting this was, but she gave him the same answer as before. When the merchant returned home that evening and took out his rug to say his prayers, out dropped the roll of cloth. It had the same mark and the same hole as the one which he had sold to the crone. The bolt, he remembered, which was a gift to a married woman who would yield to her grandson in return for it. <gasps> His own wife! The merchant was blazing with fury. As the devil invisibly stood by, he turned his wife out of the house, refusing to listen to anything she said. This is more like it, the devil chuckled to himself. The old woman followed the distracted wife to see where she went and saw that she ran to the house of her cousin, where she threw herself upon a bed, crying bitterly and refusing to explain anything to anyone. The following morning the old woman went to see her grandson, a lusty youth who was no better than he should be. Come, my fine young fellow, she said to him, I am going to introduce you to a fine and intelligent lady who is lonely and distraught. She took the youth to the house where the merchant's wife was resting and, profiting from the anxiety and confusion of the lady, insisted that the two should remain together. Such was the bewilderment of the pair that they simply sat in the room, looking at one another as though mesmerized by the crone. Now the ancient hag sped to the merchant's shop. As soon as he saw her, he started to cry and beat his breast, calling out, O oh, crone of ill fortune, why should you choose me to be the instrument of the seduction of my own wife by your infernal, misbegotten grandson? Why have you come back to torment me? Be gone before I kill you! And there was much more in the same vein. The old woman stood her ground until the merchant was somewhat out of breath, and then she said, O oh, king of merchants, I really have no idea as to the reason for your words. I only come to say that I am here to ask for the return of my silk, which I seem to have left by some oversight at your house, but there is nobody at home. The devil was wheezing into her ears as he heard this, suffocating with stifled laughter. What? shouted the merchant. Do you mean to tell me that it is not my wife who is to be suborned by means of the silk? Certainly not. All that happened was that I chanced upon your house when I was looking for a place to pray, and negligently left the material there. Almost beside himself with the remains of his fury, with grief and anguish at the injustice which he had done to his wife, the merchant cried, Oh, that I could get my beloved wife back! Now, said the hag, I may be able to help you there. If only you can get her back, kind woman, said the merchant, I would give you a thousand pounds and in gold. Done, screamed the harridan, and skipped out of the shop. Don't tell me that you're going to do someone a good turn, you crazy old jade, rustled the devil into her ear. Get away from me, you fool, so that a real expert can get to work, screeched the hag, while a look of ultimate cunning spread across her features. The devil lurked beside her as she made her way to the prison where her grandson and the merchant's wife were held. As soon as she saw the jailer at the prison gate, the hag started to keen and sway. O oh, most noble of all guardians of the justice of the king, to think that in my old age I should have been brought to this. Yet perhaps, good sir, kind gentleman, illustrious one, you may be able to help me. She held out a golden sovereign, and the jailer looked at her with greater interest. What do you want? he gruffed. Only that I should be allowed to enter for a few small moments to see my grandson, who has, quite rightly of course, been locked up in your charge, brave custodian of justice. Well then, if you have another coin to match that one, something might be arranged, said the man. Quick as a flash, she passed him two gold pieces, 
and he let her in. As soon as she reached the dungeon where the accused pair were locked in adjoining cells, she went to the one where the merchant's wife was and unbolted the door. Hurry and take my old robe and veil and leave me yours. Leave this jail pretending to be me and join your husband. That is, if you are willing to reward me for your deliverance and his forgiveness. I have a thousand gold pieces at home. Would that be enough? cried the distraught woman. That will do nicely. But mind that you do not go back on your word, or I shall tell the merchant that you really were guilty after all, croaked the hag. So the merchant's wife put on the crone's clothes, and the crone dressed herself as the wife, and she and the lad were left in the dungeon while the merchant's wife rushed home to her delighted husband. That evening, according to law, the examining magistrate visited the jail to see whether there was real cause for the incarceration of its inmates. When he arrived at the cell where the hag was, he asked, why are these people being kept here? They were seized on an accusation of immorality, my lord judge, said the jailer. The hag threw off her veil and whined, Noble judge, I am a woman of ninety years of age, and this is my grandson, who is hardly more than sixteen years old. Here are the papers to prove it. We were sitting talking innocently together when some miscreant denounced us to the police on this absurd charge. Please, noble sir, order our release at once, for we have indeed suffered enough. The magistrate, furious, turned upon the jailer and the policeman in charge of the case, and roared, Is this the way in which justice is being done in our land? Discharge this innocent old lady and her charming grandson at once. To the escort he said, Give the jailer and the policeman ten strokes with your switch. As the old woman and her grandson walked away from the jailhouse, they came upon the devil. I'm off, he said, for after seeing such a performance I know that I cannot compete. And he opened his wings and flew straight back to Jehenim. And that is why you never come across any devilment in Amman, since the old lady has not tried her hand at it again. <laughs>